By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome to the Dungeons of Magic. I mean, look at this setup. How cool is this? That playmat in the middle and the shadows. And I'm just really looking forward to kind of show you the match in this setting. And this is actually the first match, round one match played at the Paladins of the North Cup held in Groningen. And this is organized by Nick uh, Koos and Jasper. So a big shout out to you guys for just an amazing, not just this event, but an amazing weekend. It's been fantastic. And also a big thanks to Dion. Dion is just an, a great guy, very good old school player. He's got an epic collection, but also he's got a really good camera setup and he took it with him so that I could use it for the stream and also to record the matches. So thank you very much for that. And that is why we are going to enjoy some high quality recordings today and that's just fantastic. Now um, let's talk about the match, shall we? Because in this match we're going to look at Florian, the player from Germany. Uh, I've played against him a few times, never won, and he always brings this very strong robots deck to the table. So if you're into robots, you're gonna love this match. And he's playing against a player I don't really know that well. His name is Justin, and he's playing blue and white flyers, I believe. So it's always good to see new players in action. So Justin, good luck. I can tell you Florian is really an all-star. And um, yeah, this is, this is already a tough matchup, but I'm sure I'm gonna enjoy uh, to see you play as well and see what you can do against Florian. Who knows, maybe you'll win. It's always possible, blue and white, of course, being a strong combination. Now, before I start with the deck decks, I would just like to point out that you can also skip this section, as always, uh, by checking the timestamps below. And you can find, uh, click on the timestamps uh, that's called MTG Games. If you click on there, that will take you straight to the game action. I know some of you enjoy just going to the game straight away, check the deck deck after, or some people just don't want to check the deck decks at all. I mean, that's all good, of course, but by using those timestamps, it's really easy to kind of go through this video, kind of like, like you would with a CD, right? You just go to the next track if you want to. So it's, it's all up to you. You're in control as the, the viewer. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, I would like to start with the deck text, and I'm actually gonna start with the deck of Florian. Let's take a look at his Robots Brew. And here we see the deck of Florian. So this is really your Robots build, and like I said in the introduction, Florian is, is really good with the Robots deck. He plays with it so often, he tweaks it all the time, so I really have high expectations of him uh, in this matchup. And uh, it's it's play it's called robots by the way for an obvious reason. There are four Suchis in here, four trikes, and two tetravuses. So just a lot of artifact creatures, a lot of robots. So let's kind of start here on the left side of the deck and kind of go through the deck, and I'll explain what I think Florian wants to do with this and what people want to do playing a robots deck. So there first we see the two sages of Latinam and the Atok. Now these are just great sack outlets, right? Sage of Latinam, one blue and one to cast for a one-two creature. You can tap, sacrifice an artifact, and then you get to draw a card. Now this may sound pretty bad but it's actually really good like for example if you play Triskelion and you know it's a 4-4 but you can shoot the counters off right to deal one damage to any target so when your Triskelion is just a 1-1 you can sack it to your Sage get a card back and also your trike goes to the graveyard which can be relevant in this deck because Florian is also playing with animate deaths so you can have a scenario where you know he plays the trike, he deals three damage to the opponent, or maybe you know even better, kill some creatures on the side of the opponent. Most people play with like one-one creatures or one toughness creatures like Birds of Paradise, Savannah Lions, Lanaware Elves. You can kill them with the trike, Prodigal Sorcerer. So you can kill those really easily with your Triskelion, but then you're kind of left with an empty shell, right? You've got a weak creature. Well, you can sack that creature to the Sage, get a card in return, and if you're lucky, you're even going to find an enemy dead get it back out and put it on the field again. Um, the same thing kind of goes for Atok, of course. Atok, one red and one, also a one, two creature. You can sacrifice a creature to the Atok and then the Atok gets plus two, plus two. So it means that when your, your Tetravus or when your Triskelion is kind of an empty shell, you can still use it because of these creatures. That's quite good. Then we see some, I guess also some, some finishes, some handy cards. Lightning Bolt, of course, an absolute all-star. Two of those in this deck. One Fireball and then one Wheel of Fortune. And I think kind of knowing Florian, I think he's probably constantly tweaking, trying to find out what is the right amount of bolts, what is the right amount of direct damage to play. So he's chosen for two bolts and one Fireball in this version of Robots. Then, of course, we see the four Suchis. Now, four Suchis... Um, it's just a really good card and it's even better in Swedish because in Swedish you don't have mana burn. So Suchi is a 4-4 creature and if it gets killed, you get 4 mana, right? But if you cannot use that mana, it means you get 4 mana burn. And, and this can happen, for example, when you're in combat and somebody plays a disenchant 
on your Suchi. But the nice thing is here with Swedish, you don't have mana burn. Now, another really nice little synergy here is, I mean, I'm not sure if it's gonna happen, but it is a possibility that you feed your Suchi to the Atok and then you use those four mana to kind of um, use your Fireball, right? Because it's basically four free mana that you can use and you can pump that into your Fireball. That's always kind of a nice uh, a finisher. You can also, of course, use it for your Brain Geyser, for example, to draw four cards. Now, that would be pretty epic. Um, we also see then a Soul Ring that kind of makes sense. Then we see the two usual suspects in black, Mind Twist and Demonic Tutor, super strong cards. Of course, we're going to see that. Actually, looking at the black portion of the deck, it is very limited, right? We only see that Mind Twist, the Demonic Tutor, and those two anime deaths. Now, obviously, we are also seeing some Mistress Factories. The nice thing is when you're like heavy invested uh, in artifacts with your deck, you don't really mind um, having colorless mana instead of colored mana. So I think the Mistress Factories here are not gonna hurt the mana base of Florian as much as Mistress Factories can do in other brews. You know, in all honesty, I think that more decks, not this deck, in this deck, these factories were great, but I think that more decks should look critically at their mana base and maybe conclude, hey, maybe I should play with three Mistress Factories or two Mistress Factories or maybe none at all. Give it a try and you'll see that in some decks, it's, it's really better. Not in all decks, it's still a good creature, but in some decks. Also, by the way, Mishra's Factory is a great target for your copy artifacts. We do see the copy artifacts there because Mishra's Factories can pump each other. So it can just get out of hand really, really quickly. I think the four copy artifacts, by the way, are just absolutely huge. They're so important for this deck. One blue and one to cast for an enchantment. And when it comes into play, you choose an artifact and it copies that artifact. Now your opponent can still respond by destroying the artifact it wants to copy. In that case, it has to choose a new target. If that's not on the field, something really weird happens, the spell, the copy artifact just stays there as an enchantment on the field. So this still could be relevant if you have some way to maybe boomerang it or whatever. Um, I don't think it's relevant in this deck, but I just wanted to mention it because it, it's something you usually see when the copy artifact has no target that people think it fizzles and they put it in their graveyard. That's actually not the case. It stays on the battlefield. Um, so we've got those copy artifacts. Again, super strong card because there are just so many great targets in this deck. Uh, under there, we see the two animate deaths. I already talked about those briefly, right? It's just a really good combination with your Tetravis or Triskelion. Uh, Tetravis, we haven't really talked about, by the way. It's six to cast for a 1-1 one, one flying creature with three plus one plus one counters. And in your upkeep, you can take the plus one plus one counters off to make little Tetravites, little 1-1 one, one flyers. So... What you could have is a scenario where you take the counters from Tetravus, you get three 1-1 one, one flyers, you have your 1-1 one, one flying Tetravus, like mom, I, I guess, you know, uh, the main Tetravus, and you've got your three Tetravites. You can sack the Tetravus uh, to the Sage of Latinam, have it in your graveyard and use your anime dead to get it back, and then again you can have three more 1-1 uh, one, one flyers, right? So it's, it, yeah, it's just pretty cool. There are just a lot of ways here to abuse the uh, Tetravites and the Triskelions uh, in this deck. So that makes it really strong. Then if we look at the other side there, we see Mana Drain, Brain Geyser, Transmute Artifact. Again, really good card in this deck. Transmute Artifact, two blue to cast cards from the Antiquities. Uh, you can put it on an artifact, then that artifact is sacked, and you can look up, you can tutor for a new artifact for the same casting cost, or when it has less casting cost, the artifact that you're sacking, you kind of have to pay the extra mana. So for example, if you would sack a mana vault to it and you want a Triskelion, then you know mana vault's casting cost is one, so you gotta pay five extra and then you get the trike on the battlefield. I mean, this card is just really, really good. Then we see some lands, we see, oh, of course, the Black Lotus, <laughs> which again is super good because Florian wants to have those mana. He wants to go up to six as fast as he can and start dropping Triskelions like crazy. So it all fits his strategy. Of course, we see Ancestral Recall. We see Time Twister. We see, uh, again, Time Twister, really good. You know, when you have a lot of creatures in your bin, Time Twister is great because you can just shuffle them back in and you can start playing them again. Uh, we also see Time Walk. Then we see the Moxin. We've got the Mana Volts. We've got one Felwer Stone, which I kind of like that one Felwer Stone. Maybe, Florian, you want to let me know why there's one Felwer Stone and, for example, not four Mana Volts. I guess... This is my guess, uh, but please, Florian, let me know. I guess because Felwerstone is just really good with mana fixing, because usually your opponents will play with City of Brass, and when your opponent has a City of Brass, your Felwerstone becomes very powerful because it can make any color of mana. Now, of course, City of Brass is from the Arabian Nights expansion, and guess what? We do see one City in a Bottle main. Uh, City in a Bottle is just brutal against Arabian aggro strategies, right? All the cards from Arabian Nights need to be discarded. You can no longer play any other Arabian Nights cards as long as City in a Bottle is in play. 
I think this card works extremely well in this deck because of Transmute Artifact, right? There could be a situation where um, City in a Bottle has no use. He can simply use Transmute Artifact to get rid of it, but even better, he only plays with one, right? So you're like, okay, he only plays with one. What's the chance of actually finding it? Well, the chance is pretty good when he needs it because he's got Demonic Tutor to look for it and he's got Transmute Artifact. So if he needs a City in a Bottle, he's basically playing with three of those, right? This, he, he, he can look it up with those two cards. So it really makes sense here. And of course, he also has the Sage and the Atok as sack outlets. So it, 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 it's not a lost card. If it is a lost card, he can sack it to the Sage or the Atok. So it's, I think it's a really good inclusion in this deck. Then we see uh, Chaos Orb, we see a Mox, then over there we see the sideboard, which some cards I really, really like. By the way, Falling Star is pretty cool and also a, a Mirror Universe. Okay, so um, this is the deck of Florian. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Justin. And here we see, well, not the deck of Justin, but a few cards of Justin's deck because I don't have a deck photo, unfortunately, but I do have kind of an idea of what he's playing. So like I said in the introduction, I believe it's a blue-white Flyers deck and I also believe it's kind of a budget deck, which I kind of like because we just saw uh, a Florian's deck, which of course is full of all the power cards, all the great cards, and then we're going to see him play against this kind of more control build. Um, a more budget build, I should say. And and blue-white, of course, is a really good control color. Why is that a good control color? Because you've got counter magic, but you also have those white cards that you can play whenever. Your Swords to Plowshares, your Disenchant, and your Balance. And they're just really good at taking care of problems. So the hard thing when you play counter magic is when you get behind on board, when you cannot counter fast enough, which is definitely possible against Florian's deck because he can ramp up like crazy, um, you have a problem, right? Because you're behind on board, so it's hard to keep mana open for a counter spell. And that is where you can still use your swords and disenchant. They're quite forgiving. They're instant, so you can use them on the end step of your opponent, and you can untap again and have all your counter magic up. So it's really quite nice. So I think the game that Justin is hoping to play for this matchup is kind of to survive the first couple of, you know, first four or five turns of the game and then he's going to start playing some big flyers right so he's playing azure drake ghost ship and sarah angel and i think it's really cool that you're playing an azure drake and ghost ship because usually players make a decision one or the other you're playing both which is nice i also think that when you're playing blue you should play or a sea monster or a ship so it's good that you, you play a ship it's pretty cool um and of course sarah angel one of the best creatures i'm sure he's also playing with control magic so i mean it's going to be a little bit David against Goliath because, like I said, Justin's, I believe, playing powerless with the budget brew and Florian's got all his weapons. Then again, maybe, Justin, I'm, I'm maybe I make a mistake and I'm going to see you all of a sudden cast an Ancestral Recall. I don't know because I, I, I don't know your deck, so we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to this match to kind of see the underdog in my eyes that's really Justin against the favorite Florian here. So um, yeah, this is all I can really say about Justin's deck. Sorry, guys. Uh, Justin, if you're listening to this, let us know uh, how your deck performed at the tournament. And for now, we're going to go to the match. Let's get ready for Florian versus Justin, Robots versus Blue and White Flyers. Game number one is about to begin. We have Florian with the white sleeves and a robots deck. He's sitting on the right and then on the left we've got Justin with blue white flyers. And let's see, I believe it's Justin on the play. It looks like he's got some sorts of plowshares in hand there. We see a power sink as well. So he's playing power sink, spell blast and counter spell. Wow. And it looks like both players are still deciding if they want to keep or not. I think Florian wants to keep here. And, yep, Justin's going to start. He's going to start with a basic island and a pass. Let's see what Florian can do. Is he going to have an explosive start? Ooh, that is explosive, all right. Not the way I thought it would be, but it's explosive enough. Starting with the Library of Alexandria. And then passing, of course, a Mox Jet before passing turn, though, because he doesn't want to get stuck with eight cards in hand. That makes absolute sense. Seven in hand now, and then there's a pass turn. Ooh, there's going to be Spell Blast on the Mox Jet. I love that. That is really cool. That's one of the nice things about Spell Blast for one blue. You can, you know, you can counter a Mox, you can counter a Mox Jet. Uh, uh, sorry, a Mox or a, a, a Black Lotus. That's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, he's got now his two blue up, which should kind of be a red flag here for Florian. And I wonder what he's going to do. I mean, of course, he's got that active low, so he could also choose to just kind of play through the counter magic of his opponent, Justin. 
I believe he's got eight in hand now, going to seven. They're probably going to activate the Loa after. Seems to be in the tank here. What to do? Does he want to ramp up, take a risk? I don't think he does. Maybe it's hard for him. Oh, there we see a strip mine on the blue, giving him an opening. And he's going to draw an extra card again. And then he's going to play a Black Lotus. Are we going to see another Spell Blast? No, we're not. And now he's going to draw for turn here. So, um, you know, Florian really wanted to get that Black Lotus on the field, kind of create an opening for himself with that strip mine. Using his Library of Alexandria now in his upkeep so that he gets to draw two cards, right? Untap, upkeep, use the Loa, then draw a card for turn. There we see a Mishra's Workshop. So he's got a lot of mana sacking the Lotus. There we see a Triskelion. And this is great, of course, for Florian, because what I kind of missed here is there was no land drop here by Justin. That means big problems for him looking at the trike, reading it. Ooh, man, if you don't know what that does, you're going to know it after this matchup. It is one of the key cards in Florian's deck. So Florian here putting on the trike arms. Really cool counters there. And he's going to pass the turn so he's kind of showing it off like I love I love this stuff like I love this old and handmade stuff all the counters that are made and there are some questions here maybe about how the trike actually works and when you can take the counters off now one of the good things about the trike is you don't have to tap it to take a counter off so you can do it straight away you can when it comes into play you can already shoot those three counters wherever you want and here's a pass turn unfortunately here for Justin cannot find anything and then against an active Loa I mean he needs a miracle already, even though he's still on 20, he's so far behind right now. There we see a volcanic island. There's an attack here, gonna drop to 16. Are we gonna see, for example, a Suchi here by uh, Florian, also playing with a full playset of those. There is a lightning bolt. A little bit confused as to why he put himself on 17 instead of 16. I believe he should be a point lower. Anyway, he's on 14. I believe he should be on 13. And maybe these players are discussing that right now. Yeah, so now he's correcting his live total. It's always good to kind of check things, take your time. The thing is, in old school, it's also very relaxed. I, um, Players always take a moment, and uh, like I said in the introduction, I believe Justin's pretty new to the old school scene, so it's always kind of nice to then play against a veteran like Florian and kind of learn some new things. Unfortunately for Justin, I mean, he is low on land. He's found his second blue, though, so maybe he can do some countering. I do know he's got a power sink in hand. So there we see a Mishra's factory. There we see an attack again, so he's going to drop to nine. Are we going to see, for example, a uh, copy artifact? Yeah, of course, first the activation. Going to go to eight cards in hand. I'm expecting him to play even more firepower. Doesn't have six, though, so he cannot play another uh, Tetravis or Triskelion. Is there going to be... Yeah, there's the copy artifact. This is as to be expected. Now we're going to see a power sink. No, a counter spell. He could have played... A, I believe he's got a power sink in hand. Maybe I mistook the counter spell for a power sink. That could also be a possibility. So now he's finding a white, so at least he's finding some, some lands. It's probably too little too late, but at least he's found something. There's a pass turn. I mean, remember, um, you know, the trike, you can hit for four, then you can take three off and deal even three more points of damage. He's probably just first going to attack and going to put his opponent on five. Okay, he's going to tap the workshop first. There is a mana vault in hand. What he could do here is also, of course, activate the, um, the Mistress Factory, but it's pretty risky playing against white. I mean, you're looking at disenchants and, and, and swords. So he's playing a Chaos Orb here first, having one floating still from the workshop. Putting that there on the dice that he's got one mana floating. I would probably exactly use the Loa first. To go up to eight cards. No, he's going to use it to activate. Interesting. And he's activating the planes. This makes absolute sense because now if he's going to disenchant, 
Okay, there's a Swords. Which is not too bad. He can still deal three points of damage here to, uh, to Justin. So he's going to drop to six. A little bit confused as to why he is not lowering his life total. Because he's taking three points of damage from the trikes. He's going to go to six. There we go. And now we are going to see the activation. Yeah, is he going to go for the white source or is he going to go for the blue source? Yeah, I guess it would go for the white as well. And he can still animate the factory. So there he goes. So now the planes is gone. He can deal two points of damage. He can also choose to play, for example, the Mana Vault and perhaps the Suchi if he's got that in hand. That's the play he's going to go for. Oh, he still had one, of course, from the workshop. That makes sense. Six in hand, I believe. So it's probably best to just attack... With the factory, no, he's going to play something more. I want to put more pressure on the board. There's a land for turn. Going to tap six. Here we go. There's a Tetravus. And now we're going to see a power sink. There's that power sink I talked about earlier. So this is actually pretty good by Justin. I mean, despite the fact that he's only found like a few lands this turn, he's been under pressure. He's still kind of able to use his counter spells at the right time. And obviously, he's still very much behind on board. He still needs a miracle to win it. But I'm, I'm kind of impressed here how Justin's still hanging on, clinging on to the life. And Florian kind of chose to go off the Loa here, perhaps regretting it after seeing that power sink. On the other hand, he does now have some more information for the rest of the game. He kind of knows now that Justin is playing with and power sink and spell blast and counter spell. So that's kind of huge. Really, really a control deck. And we see Florian looking at the cards. Is he just going to pass, perhaps? I mean, he's got six. He could go up to seven again. It could be an option. Both players here signing the tournament card. Of course, a Northern Paladin. The winner gets that beautiful card signed by all the participants. Looking at his hand. What is he going to do? I really wonder, I mean, does he want to go off the Loa here? Yes, he does. Another land. Tapping six. Are we going to see a Triskelia? No, another Tetravis. So Tetravis number two. I think, Justin, if you can counter it, I would counter it. It's not as bad as the Triskelion because, you know, if you, for example, can find a Swords or a Disenchant, in response, Florian cannot take the counters off. He can only do that during the upkeep. So that makes it kind of difficult. And of course, that extra land played by Florian is going to um, protect Florian from a potential power sink. So after seeing that power sink, of course, he wants to make sure that he can play that out. Okay, there we see an Atok. And remember, there are still counters on the Tetravis. They're not yet 1-1 one -one flyer flying Tetravites. Two cards in hand, Florian stepped out, passing turn. So there's a white source. If he's got a disenchant or a sword, he needs to play it now on the Tetravus. Of course, that Atok also being a huge problem. Okay, there we see a sword to plowshares. So that's gone. Florian tapped out. I mean, he's going to feed it to the Atok probably. Why not? Making it a 3 4 creature. Exactly, that's what he's going to do, pointing towards the Atok, sacking it to the Atok. Making it a 3-4. I mean, it does mean that Florian doesn't gain any life, but at this point in the game, that's completely irrelevant. So Justin reading the card again, making sure that he knows what happens when... And now we see a little counter there indicating that it's been pumped with plus two, plus two. It's always nice to be like really clear with these things. And he's now going to pass. So there's an untap. He's going to take a damage from the vault, drop to 19, finding another vault. Also having a transmute artifact there. I think if you're Florian, you probably, yeah. Okay, there we see a transmute artifact. 
I wonder what he's going to look up. For example, if he wants to find Chris Kellyan, he just needs a lot of mana though. Okay, using his workshop to cast another mana vault. So one mana vault he's gonna sack. He's gonna tap it for three extra. He's gonna find a trike. So this is where I'm a little confused, but Florian is a very good player, so I'm sure he's using it the correct way because what I see happening here, or perhaps he's gonna... He's tapped a workshop for three mana, right? He used one of those mana to cast a mana vault and then tapped that mana vault for three extra plus the two extra from the workshop and that means that he's got enough added mana to find the Triskelion. But I wonder if with the Transmute Artifact you actually cast the Artifact. I'm not quite sure if you do. Then again, I could be wrong with that as well. So maybe people uh, that are watching this video and are really good with rules, can you let me know if you can actually do this? And now he's going to animate the factory and there's also an attack here with the ATOC. And he is animating the factory. Now the cool thing is here, Florian can use the counters of the Triskelion to kill the Mishra's factory here before blockers are declared. He's choosing not to. Then he's going to block exactly and then it's game. So he's going to block to the ATOC. ATOC becomes 5-6, going to take 5 points of damage and then he can kill him with the counter from the Triskelion. And, I, you know, Justin, there was no way you could have won this, so don't worry. Um, but I still wonder, so people um, that are watching this, if you know this, let me know. Can you use that workshop also for the mana for your Transmute Artifact? Because as I understand it, you can only use your Mishra's workshop to cast an artifact. So the big question is, are you actually casting it through Transmute Artifact? Does that work the same way? Perhaps it does. Florian is a good player, so I'm definitely giving him the benefit of the doubt, but I, I thought it, it wasn't possible. So if you're knowledgeable on this topic, let me know. I would love to hear from you. And now uh, both of these players are going to dive into their sideboards and we're going to catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So Justin, at least on the player, hopefully he'll be a little bit more lucky. He was very unlucky in that game one, right? Finding a Loa and also not finding lands at a certain point of the game. So let's hope for him that he's a little bit more lucky. He is playing with a lot of counter spells, so the fact that he gets to start is a big advantage for Justin here. Let's see. Oh man, again a Loa. Unbelievable. How unlucky can Justin be here facing the Loa again? Uh, that's, that's just really tough. This is really, really bad luck. And I kind of feel that... You know, in this matchup, Justin needs all the luck that he can have. And just being so unlucky, it's going to be really, really tough for him to to win this match and win the second game here. And, of course, we see here Florian starting to use the lowest. He's going up to nine cards. And there he goes. Boom. There's a time walk. What a start for Florian here. Seven in hand, I believe. He's going to untap. Going, going up to eight. Probably play, play a land to perhaps pass turn, just keeping the Loa open. Or does he have some more options? His deck can be very, very explosive. Of course, he's got some plays to make. He's got the Moxen, he's got the Mana Volts. So perhaps he wants to play a land and then tap the Loa for another card and then play a Mox, for example. That could definitely be an option, although I don't think I see a Mox in hand. I believe I see a Copy Artifact there and a Fireball maybe on the end. Let's see what he's going to do here. Tapping the Badlands. Interesting. Ooh, tapping the Loa for mana. We don't see that often. There we see a Demonic Tutor. So I believe he's now on five cards. And he's going to find... It's probably going to be an Ancestral Recall. He could also go for Time Twist, but that's like taking too much risk. And also because you have that Loa, you want to go back to 7 in hand as fast as you can. So an Ancestral really makes sense here. It's not the most exciting play to make, but it is the best play to make. Cutting his deck here, offering it to Justin to cut. And he's going to pass turn. And then in his upkeep, he's going to cast, exactly, he's going to cast Ancestral Recall in the upkeep here of Justin probably. He's going to draw 3. I believe he goes back up to 8, if I'm correct. And then uh, Justin's going to draw his card for turn. So it's finally his turn again. And he's already so far behind. 
playing a planes here now. What his deck is kind of built for is just sit back and pass turn. The problem here, of course, is the huge card advantage that Florian already has with the Loa and the Ancestral Recall. I believe he's on nine cards now. Going through his hand. There we see Amishur's Factory tapping four. And okay, there we see Suchi expecting a counter spell here, perhaps a power sink. Exactly, there's a power sink. But I mean, if you're Florian, you don't really mind because you've got enough cards in hand anyway. So he's probably going to pass. I believe he's on seven. Oh, I guess he's on eight. Okay, just made a little miscalculation there. So he's discarding an island. There is another planes here for Justin, four cards. And look at that, he's going to tap out, he's going to do something. Here we see an Azur Drake, 2-4 card from Legends, 2-4 Flyer. He's also playing with Ghost Ships in this deck, I believe. There we see Florian drawing into a Mox Ruby. Eight in hand, you could drop the ru Ruby and then use the Loa. Go back up to eight. A little bit in the tank here, but again, I mean, this is very much Florian's game. I mean, I'm Justin, I'm just going to say it again. Don't feel bad about this because you're super unlucky facing Loa twice. And I'm not even going to talk about all the other power cards that you've seen. And I always kind of see these as bonus games when my opponent is drawing so good. I'm like, okay, if I can still kind of make this game exciting, I already see it as a victory. And of course, I also enjoy like what my opponent is doing at that moment in the game. So he's playing an anime dead here on the Suchi. So it's now a 3-4 creature. Changing the mana slightly here. Interesting choice, by the way. There we see a copy artifact. Okay, that's why he's doing it. He wants, he wants the Suchi as a target for his copy. And of course, he knows now that Justin stepped out. So he kind of had this opening. And he's going for it. And that 4-4, of course, is very good against that Azur Drake. Because Azur Drake is a 2-4 creature. So that's a pretty bad blocker for the 2-4. Justin can, of course, choose to also um, combine a block with, for example, a Mishra's Factory. And then you would make it into a really good block. Oh, look at that. He's going to tap more. No, he's not. <laughs> for a moment there, I thought he was going to... I mean, Florian stepped out. He doesn't have to worry about that. And is there Sarah Angel coming? There's a Sarah Angel. Okay, that's kind of sweet, Justin, that you're able to play out the Sarah. Attacking here with the Azur Drake and a pass. I think if you're Justin here, the only way that you could kind of maybe win it is playing very aggressive because you're not going to win the card advantage game. Um, so if you're just going to keep countering things away, you're going to lose eventually. So I do understand the strategy here. Tap for two mana. There we see a Chaos Orb. Ah, oh, he's going to flip here on the Angel, of course. Angel's going to be a goner then. If he hits it, then he'll take seven. Let's have a look. Yep. That's it. I mean, you can see Florio's an experienced old school player. Think, well, whatever. You know, he knows this is in the bag. So he's going to attack with the Factory as well, I believe. Yeah, so he's going to deal nine points of damage. He's going to drop to 11, if I'm not mistaken. Remember, Anime Dead takes one uh, power off. So minus one, minus oh, that's why that one Suchi is just a 3-4. And I think it was a really good moment in the game for Florian to kind of go aggressive there, seeing that, you know, Justin tapped out and just go for anime dead, copy the Suchi. I mean, this is just really tough for Justin. He's on 11, but it's really hard. Is he going to play another Sarah again? Looks like it. There's another Sarah Angel. Okay, that's not too bad. And I like this aggressive attack because, I mean, he's he's behind on cards anyway, so he might as well just try to put some pressure on the life total of Florian here. Florian dropping to 16. And he's back on 7, I believe, so he can use the Loa again, go to 8. Trying to find maybe an answer for the Angel. We see a Mox Chat now for Florian. He's probably trying to figure out what's the quickest way to deal with that angel. He could, of course, consider to just attack with the Suchi. 
which is a difficult situation for, for Justin, right? He doesn't want to take four damage because he will drop to seven, which is quite low, but he also doesn't want to, uh, you know, trade the Angel for the Suchi because that means that next turn he's completely open. Although he still has the Azur Drake in the factory, of course. And I guess if you're Florian, you're trying to find a way to get rid of that Angel and just swing in with everything you have. You could deal nine points of damage if the Angel is not on the table anymore. A little bit in the tank here, looking at his hand. And I'm sure that he's also having in the back of his mind this thought, okay, Justin tapped out again, so he's giving me an opening again. Looks like we're going to see the Mox Jet. No, we're not. Going to count his cards again. I believe there's still eight after activating that Loa. He's going to attack. Ooh, he's going to attack with everything. Does that mean it's got, he's got a bolt in hand? I think he's, he's showing here that he's got a bolt. I'm expecting a bolt. He could play the bolt later, of course. Doesn't need to hurry with that. The damage stays until the end of turn. He's going to drop to eight. He should drop to seven, right? He was on 11. He takes four points of damage. Not quite sure here. Maybe he was on 12, so they're going back. Exactly, yeah, should be on 7. Now are we going to see a fireball? I believe he still had a fireball, right? Or is he going to play a trike? Of course he can play a trike and just deal that last point of damage with a trike. Ooh, he's changing his mind. I am expecting him to do something with that Sarah Angel. There we see an underground sea. Tapping four, five, six. Okay, I'm expecting a trike here. Yeah, Triskelly Nenny will put one point of damage onto the Sarah Angel. Yeah, this is an ideal scenario, and again, a reason why the trike is such a good card. It's so versatile, and I remember. Um, when they started kind of coming back into old school the way it is now, that was about five five years ago, I had a big antiquities collection. And I looked at the Triskelly and I thought, okay, this card is not really good. Um, but I wanted to make a Tron deck, so I just decided to put it in. And then I, when I started playing with it, I just noticed how how good Triskelly is. It is just such a good card. And here we see Justin kind of trying to understand what just happened there. So it's really important to, to know that damage stays until the end of turn. So you don't always have to respond directly. You can just wait. If it's still your turn, the damage is still going to be on the creature. There we see a Swords to Plowshares on the Suchi. And here we see a Ghost Ship. So what I really like about Justin's deck is that he's playing with Ghost Ship and Azure Drake. I think that's really cool. And I mean, four toughness creatures in the air are pretty hard to deal with usually. And uh, let's see, there we see a Strip Mine. We're just seeing, you know, so much control from, from Florian here, which, which makes sense. He's drawn so many extra cards. He's kind of off the lower plan, by the way. He's got five in hand at the moment. I think he's trying to find a way to finish the game right now. Justin being on seven. I mean, earlier I thought I saw a fireball in hand, but perhaps I was mistaken. You know, it's hard to see, of course. So there are probably other cards, or else he would have played a fireball already. Maybe even on the ghost ship. He actually has seven right now in mana, so if he has a fireball, he can just kill Justin on the spot. So I'm pretty sure he doesn't have that fireball. That probably was a mistake for my part. Kind of I'm trying to see what's in hand here, Florian. He is starting to tap, so okay, he is going to attack with both. So the 2 2 and the 3 3. He's going to attack the 3 th uh, sorry, going to block the 3 3. So he's just going to take the two points of damage, going to drop to five. I kind of understand this play from Justin because he's like. Florian is expecting me to block the Mishra's factory, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do what he expects me to do. 
then one extra point of damage after that that also means that the trike dies no he's changing his mind here so what, what what Florian does is after damage is dealt there's two points of damage on the Triskelion and three points of damage on the ghost ship then Florian can choose to take a counter off to kill the ghost ship but it will also kill his own trike because those two, two points of damage are still on the trike until end of turn so it's quite interesting and Florian here changing his mind is like I don't want to trade my trike here for the ghost ship at least not right now I think what Florian was hoping for is that um, Justin would block the factory of the ship then he could take the two counters off to kill the ship and then he could play a transmute artifact but that plan kind of turned sour a little bit because of the unexpected blocking decision by Justin and that's why I think it's a good decision by Justin there we see a Suchi 4-4 and we still see that transmute artifact play. But now he's playing it on the Suchi, it seems. Interesting. He's gonna find a trike. So it looks like he's using the four extra mana from the Suchi, from the sacrifice, to pay the mana here for the Triskelion. And then, oh yeah, and then he can use the, because the Triskelion comes in with three plus one plus one counters, right? So he can deal three points of damage to Justin two counters still on the other trike so he can deal the last five points of damage killing Justin here I think Justin man sometimes your opponent is drawing so good there's really nothing you can do but it was great to have you on stream for the first time Florian you've been here before man thank you for sharing your deck and your skills here on Timmy Talks and uh, and for joining us here for the um, Northern Paladins of the North Cup 2022 I should say thank you and that is the episode for today. Thank you very much for watching. And if you enjoy this type of magic, make sure to come back on Tuesday because then I'll be posting a new video, a new match. And that's going to be between these two decks, Green Stompy versus Rook Valley. So two completely different decks going mano a mano. And that will be round number two played at this tournament, uh, the Paladins of the North Cup 2022. Um, and yeah, there's just before before we finish this video, I would just like to ask you to consider becoming a Patreon of Timmy Talks. There's probably an info card popping up right now. If you click on the info card, it'll take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page where you can already join, become a supporter of my channel for $1 a month. And I would really, really appreciate that if you would consider doing it because it helps me traveling to these tournaments, bringing you the live streams, getting the equipment I need, and also the time I need to make these videos for you. So if you like what I do, please consider becoming a Patreon. There are a couple of perks. One of them is that you can join the Timmy Talks online events. Also, you can join the Timmy Talks Discord. And of course, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll that we are about to see. But before I go there, there are also three other things that you can do that are completely free. One of them is liking this video. So hit that like button, it really helps a lot. Another thing you can do is comment on this video. Let me know how does Transmute Artifact work. I would love to hear from you. And the third thing is you can share this on your socials. All those things help. And if you're new to the channel, welcome to Timmy Talks and maybe even welcome to Old School. Please consider subscribing because all that helps the channel move forward. Okay, and now that I've said everything I wanted to say, I'm going to say goodbye to you with our fantastic end scroll and a special thanks to our fantastic wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Let's go to the end scroll. Somebody can see.